This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. You are the leader in the courtroom, and you want the jury to be looking to you for the answers. When you figure out your theory, never deviate. You want the facts to be consistent, complete, and credible. The defense has no problem running out the clock. Delay is the friend of the defense. It's tough to grow a firm by trying to hold on and micromanage. You've got to front load a simple structure for jurors to be able to hold on to. What types of creative things can we do as lawyers, even though we don't have a trial setting? Whatever you've got to do to make it real, you've got to do to make it real. But the person who needs convincing is you. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation. Your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, I'm again joined by my partner, Mallory Peacock. Uh, Mallory just got back from doing some focus groups in Peoria, Illinois. Learned a lot, as always, and so we thought that we would share some of what we've learned about focus groups, you know, why to do them, how to do them, what you get out of them, how to use what we get out of them. But before we dig in, I always want to thank our sponsor, Law Pods. Uh, Law Pods produces this podcast for us. They make it so easy. All we have to do is sit here and talk. They set up all the production. They do all the editing. They do all our little snippets so we can advertise it and try to get more people to listen. They just make life real easy. So if you have a podcast or you want to start a podcast, I highly recommend Law Pods. Uh, Mallory, how are you doing? Good. I'm a little exhausted from traveling all the way up to Illinois and getting back late last night, but I'm super pumped about all the information that we learned from the focus groups, which is always the case when you just finish a focus group. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to you debriefing me. We'll probably not debrief these actual groups on the air (laughs) since it's a live active case, but uh, let's just talk about, I mean, I know some of our listeners have probably done a million focus groups, but some may not have done any. So first of all, what is a focus group? So a focus group is just gathering a group of people to test your case. So it can be a small group. It can be one or two people. It can be a huge group. It can be hundreds of people. We've done them all kinds of ways. But it's a group of people that's not involved in the case, not lawyers, not your law firm, that you present pieces of your case to or the whole case and see what they think about it. Get some feedback, see what kind of questions they have so that you can address any issues that you might have before you go to trial. Trial and it's too late. So why do you, why do we do focus groups? So focus groups are so, so important, especially when you have a case that's a little more complicated to understand what do ordinary people or people that might be on your jury, what do they think about your case? Sometimes you can get so wrapped up in the minutia of your case or in some really technical details or you've learned the case so well that you think it's obvious to everybody else. So having that outside perspective is a way to get feedback to make sure you're not just buying your own bullshit. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Simply put. (laughs) And we've actually had it go both ways. I mean, I remember you and I tried a case against a bus company a few years back and we, you know, we got brought into the case four years into the litigation. So we jumped in You know, I think right before the expert deadline, we were able to find an expert and and go try the case a few months later. But we didn't think we had the best liability case until we did a focus group. Yeah, yeah, we were we were really on the fence about the case. And uh, we did. It was a small focus group. That one was a small one. We were only able to get a couple of people because we sort of did it at the last minute to try to help us prepare the presentation of the case for trial. So it was later on in the litigation after discovery had closed. It was more about how are we going to present this in a way that makes sense to the jury. And we we had been wanting to really settle that case before that focus group <laughs> because we were worried about it. And at the focus group, you know, they they changed our mind about it and then gave us some ideas for the presentation of the case. Yeah, I was embarrassed. I made the client sign off saying that she was turning down a $125,000 settlement offer against our advice. And we thought we were probably going to lose the case. And then she was adamant she wanted her trial. And so we said, well, we, we better do a focus group and at least test our theories and because we we had more than one angle we could have gone right gone in and we saw that one angle just resonated so strongly in the in the eight or, I think we had like eight or ten people I don't think it was that small but they it, they were just so strong about it then when we went into trial we didn't even talk to them anymore they, they wanted to start talking to us during the trial we said no we got this and uh, you know we got a nice verdict on that case and I think that the uh, 
I think it helped get us past some fears we had. Now, usually it's the other thing, other way around. Usually we think we have a great case and then we find out all the problems in the focus group, but it does, it can happen both ways. So let me ask you, what are the, uh, is there more than one type of focus group? I mean, I, mean, you, I know that there's like in-person, there's virtual, but as far as, you know, I'm thinking like concept versus kind of testing the case and adversarial, what, what are the kind of types of focus groups that you've done? You know, there are so many different ways that you can test a case. I don't necessarily like to put them into those little boxes, only because there's so many different variations of it that you can do just depending on where you're at in the case, what your goals are, and why you're doing it. So I would say, I'll give you some categories of focus groups, but I wouldn't get so married to the categories of focus groups. What's more important is that you think about what is the purpose of this group? What do I need to get out of them? What is my goal? And write that down and then do that. Right? I mean, that's do do whatever is necessary to meet that goal. But there's kind of some broad categories. There's a concept focus group, which is what it sounds like is testing the concept of your case. So this is more appropriate in a case that's maybe more complicated, um, or there's a conceptual issue that you're wondering, is the jury really going to get get where I'm going here. So a regular auto case concept focus groups aren't, aren't going to give you a ton of information because juries already have experience with them and they already understand it. Um, but a concept group in a product liability case is so critical because you need to understand people's experiences with the product, with the ideas surrounding why it's defective or how it could be defective and whether they understand, you know, even the jury instructions. So Concept focus groups are way more useful when you have some really complicated issue. Um, You can also use a concept focus group to test evidence. So is a testimony persuasive? Is a witness going to come off well? I mean, what what do people think about this particular witness? Um, Is this illustration or diagram that I've created convincing? Is it confusing? Is this animation showing what I think it shows? Um, So those are also concept focus groups, but they're evidentiary concepts. So uh, they're a little bit different than just testing legal concepts in the case. And then the kind of the next level is not all the way adversarial, but it's actually presenting the case. So you may not do a full mock trial, but you're presenting both sides of the case, arguments on both sides. The best way to do those is to get two lawyers involved. One plays the role of the plaintiff, one plays the role of the defendant, um, and makes the arguments that that each side would make. Um, And then see what the focus group thinks about it. And then there's an even higher level of adversarial, which is a true mock trial where you're going to present not just arguments, but some of the evidence that a real jury might hear. So maybe you'll play some deposition clips. Maybe you'll show some of the actual documents that you might use or the illustrations that you've created along with the argument itself. So it's more like a mock trial. Those we typically do closer in time to the case because the purpose of the mock trial focus group is not so much to find out how to, what discovery to get, right? How to to work up the case. It's more about, I have all this information, what's the most persuasive way to present it? And and what argument on the other side is going to be very persuasive to the jury that you have to address in advance? Yeah, and I've seen it both ways on the adversarial, whether or not you have two lawyers, you know, one arguing each side, or whether you have one neutral person presenting this side says this, this side says that. Now, you know, when I've talked to Artemis Malakpour or uh, David Ball, and they say, well, it's important just to have one person, you know, argue both sides, and, and someone's going to be able to do it from a neutral frame, because that way you don't have the personality effects or differences in skill level, the advocates being a confounding factor. But I've also found that there's something about the competitive drive between lawyers, even when you're playing, uh, you want to win. And I think you you reach a little deeper when you're competing with each other. And I also think that there's also a rehearsal factor. I mean, the you know, in, in cases where we've done a lot of adversarial focus groups and I've done presentations, I'm really ready to give my opening because I said something, watched or been at least briefed on because I have trouble watching them. And we'll talk about that later. Mm-hmm. People not get what I said and learning how to refine it and say it more clearly and actually be understood and persuasive. Uh, I think that maybe I get slightly less accurate data, but I become a better advocate. So, you know, it's it's um, it's a mix because I think there's also I don't know if it'd be a true focus group, but 
you know, some things we do closer to trials, give our opening and get out of the way and see what people thought. Did they understand us? Were they persuaded? Uh, you know, do a practice for dire. And then what do they think about us? What do they think about the case? Did, you know, did we go too far looking for causes that cause strikes that now we look like we have a horrible case or, you know, are there a lot of bad people left on that we didn't identify? You know, it's, uh, it's just an interesting, you know, there's a million different things you can do. I do want to go and turn back towards the beginning. So, you know, I used to think I can't do a focus group at the very beginning because I don't have enough information. And I remember you and I had one, it was a oil field explosion, bad burn case. And, you know, we were setting it up ourselves and, you know, we were in a county where we didn't know a lot of people. I think we tried direct mail. I think I bought a mailing list of voters in the county yeah. or something that we mailed to. And we only had three people show up. Right. We had... <laughs> We had only done some very, very basic written discovery. We we hardly had any, you know, we hadn't taken a deposition yet. And it is one of the most valuable focus groups we ever did. Because one thing I found out about is that everybody in that community either has worked in the oil field, they know someone who's worked in the oil field, they know basic concepts, they knew what things were called. And I also learned that I didn't. And I learned very quickly that I was, one, I didn't understand the case. And they actually understood the issues better than I did. But two, I was going to have to get some visuals really quickly in that case because the oil field people were going to be able to play word games with me and and say i didn't name things properly and that i didn't use the right jargon and so you know what we did in that case we had a a, a scale 3d model 3d printed model of the scene showing where everything was so i can just say what is this what is that and and make the witnesses name it and use their jargon and it totally saved the case. And and it turned it's our biggest recovery we've ever had at the firm. Mm -hmm. And I think that those three people who showed up at that focus group were the impetus of that huge recovery we got because they, yeah, it, it wasn't a valid test of the case, but that's not what it was supposed to be. We just, we knew these are issues that resonated at least with these three people, but they educated me. And then we did a lot more focus groups later on to, to really mm -hmm. test and hone in on the case. But I just wanted to mention, you know, that on a big case where you have the budget for it, or if you're going into like a new area that you haven't done before, uh, you know, you can do a medical negligence case. And what do people think about doctors and this type of theory that you have? I mean, a you know, misdiagnosis case is different than leaving an object in somebody case. And so, you know, how much are they going to give the benefit of the doubt to the doctor on a misdiagnosis case? What's the feel, you know, in that area? Uh, and then what and what and the biggest thing is, what do they want to know? Find out what people want to know. And then you go try to shore that up in discovery. What other? You know, even like on a blown stop sign case, sometimes there is speculation like, well, was our driver on the cell phone? Was our driver late for something? And, and, and all kinds of stuff that because we had those questions asked in the focus group and even like was the stop sign in the right place? Did the, were there other crashes? Did the DOT not put the stop sign there right? And by anticipating that, we were able to then go to the discovery to eliminate those questions to show that those are not excuses for what happened. So I think those concept groups are, are super valuable if you have a case that has the budget for it. Uh, and then, of course, getting in, I think the adversarial, you know, they, they help you. I think they give you confidence or fear, depending on how they're coming out. But they right. give you some idea of how people view your case. And I think there's the good practice effect that we're able to go practice talking to people, practice talking about the case in a way that it's going to be well received. I do want to ask you another question, though. Are focus groups predictive. Can you say, well, I won, you know, $10 million in this focus group. So that's what a jury is going to do. Never. I've never seen one that's predictive. I, I, we've done some even with hundreds of people. And I still am not confident that they're predictive because they, <laughs> I mean, you never know who's going to show up to jury duty, the day of jury duty. And there's no way to anticipate what the makeup of your jury will be, who they will be, what their life experiences are. Um, and so you just, you know, you can't rely on that. The other issue that you have in a focus group is whether you're fairly and accurately presenting the other side. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, you do your best to try to think of what would this particular defense attorney present as their case at trial? How will they argue it? What, but until you see what they're going to argue and how they argue it, there, there's just, there's no way to predict that unless they're involved. But of course, they would never be involved in our focus. group. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I mean, there's just there's so many variables that an amount of money is not predictive. What issues people find and are concerned about? I think that is predictive. So um, if, if there's a person on the focus group that's really hung up on whether or not it was rainy that day, that's an easy question for you to answer 
you know, in the presentation of your case. And it's good that you know, because you might have a focus group member, I mean, a jury member that is back there in the jury room saying, oh, I just, you know, I just can't decide because I didn't know if it was raining, you know? Yeah. So um, that the issue part, I think is predictive of what people will find issues with, but the, the numbers, no, never. It just, there's too many variables. Yeah. And there's also, there's a magic that happens during a trial. Now, sometimes it happens for us and sometimes it happens to us, but, right. you know, just connection with the juror, how a witness is impeached, the rulings that a judge makes, you know, you, you think you're going to win or lose certain evidentiary rulings and then the, the judge does something unexpected. Uh, sometimes no matter how good your case law is, the trial judge disagrees with you and you have a different ruling. And so, you know, when you're doing the focus group, you have to make some assumptions about what's coming in, what's coming out. I mean, we often test the worst case, like if all the bad stuff comes in, this is what's going to happen. And, and, you know, and if it's a big enough case and we have the budget, test it both ways. OK, and we know we had one with a, a client who was undocumented. You know, we were 95 percent sure that the judge would keep that out. But we ran it both ways because we knew that it was an incendiary issue. And we found that with some, not all jurors, it had a huge it was a huge weight dragging down the value of the case or just a, a certain people that would not give a large sum of money to someone who was undocumented. And now we know if that came in, we'd have to try to identify and strike those people on in jury selection. But we also knew that we really needed to fight the issue because the law is that it's not relevant. The case in Texas, of the, the law is pretty good on that issue. Uh, so, you know, it's just one of those things that we have to do. I think you can also test medical bills. There's a big I don't even know it's a controversy anymore, there, but there's a big question in cases. Do you do you present your past medical bills or not? Are they an anchor that's going to anchor down or not? And the other big thing is if you're in a jurisdiction that lets the defense present testimony, let's say your doctor charged $100 for something, but there's evidence that that doctor takes $15 from health insurance, $10 from Medicare, $8 from Medicaid for the same procedure, but once $100 when it's in litigation, you know, does that stink come over to the rest of your case and drag down the rest of your damage? damages so that you'd be better off just dropping them. Uh, I know we just non-suited medicals on a tri case we have set for trial in two weeks, and our medical bills were 300 and something thousand. Mm -hmm. But we decided, uh, you know, based on our research, that the stink that that fight puts on the rest of the case, and we think we have a multi-million dollar case, why are we worried about 300,000? And why give the defense all those things to poke holes at us and try to make us look bad when instead we want to talk about how bad the crash was, how bad the company was, and you know, the horrible effects, the treatment he's going to need the rest of his life, et cetera. Right. And I, you know, testing, testing issues you're scared of uh, is really, really critical. I would say the timing of when you decide to test these issues is really important. And uh, like I said before, identifying what your real goals are for focus groups is is so critical because it depend that will affect how you present them. Um, so if the goal is to build your confidence for opening and to practice your opening, then you don't need to present the defense's opening. I mean, that's not the purpose of the focus group. The purpose is for you to practice, get comfortable, get comfortable with your hand movements, get you're getting feedback, not about necessarily the content of the case, but whether you're being understood, whether you're speaking too quickly, whether you're gestures or, or too chaotic, you know, so you're asking different questions of the focus group um, to get the feedback, because what you don't want is a week before trial, you're practicing your opening. And suddenly this focus group is telling you how terrible your case is. I mean, that's, that's not helpful to anybody uh, that what do you do at that point, right? So, right. you know, you don't want to do things that are not helpful or destroy your confidence right before trial either. So, you know, the timing of everything is really, really important. And it's so, so critical that you identify why am I really doing this? Like, what what do I want out of this? And make sure that you're asking the questions of the group that will get you information that's useful to you um, and not get you information that's not useful. I mean, like I said, that's a really good example of doing the focus group of your opening and then them saying about how terrible your case is. I mean, that's, it's too late for that, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I think another thing that's, uh, well, I have a question. Do you think that it's okay to do them yourself as far as doing the presentation, if, if it's just going to be one person presenting, let's say we're not going to have one lawyer on each side, or do you think it's important to get someone neutral because it's so hard to take the person out of being an advocate for their own case? You know, that's a tough question. I think it's really person specific, whether they're able to be neutral and whether they're able to appear neutral. I do a lot of focus groups myself as the moderator. I, in my own cases, I am the moderator of the focus group. I think 
because I'm hyper aware of the fact that I don't want them to know that I represent the plaintiff, I overweight the defense in those focus groups. I argue for the defense a little bit more, but that's the goal of those focus groups, right? Is those kind of focus groups I'm trying to figure out what are the defense arguments that are persuasive to them? What are the things that I need to address? What are additional pieces of information that we might need to go get? Um, so it's okay if I'm overweighting the defense in, in those kind of cases, but you have to be conscious and you have to do it. You can't argue with the focus group. You have to let them say sometimes what sounds like something ridiculous in order to get good information. But there are a lot of people and you have to be honest with who you are as a person <laughs> uh, that cannot do it, that, that they just cannot listen to people tell them that their case is bad. And if that's you, then you need to get someone more neutral to present your focus group. Because if you're just going to argue with focus group, you're not going to get any useful information. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I've done I've done my own. And I think it's, I think I have the self-awareness where I'm able to be neutral or even, I've had a lot of times when we've asked them out, just out of curiosity, who do you think put is put this on as paying you? And they usually think it's the defense saying, well, only a big company would spend the money to do this. They don't think Planet Flourish would spend the money and the time to do these kind of things, which is funny because uh, I think we do more of it than the other side does. But I think so. The uh, But it's taken me, you know, time to get there. And when you have a real emotional attachment to your case, like this is your first big case or this is like a case you really, really need to win, or and that's just your personality. You're just a, a bulldog street fighter and you're just, you can't help but argue your case, then you're not the right person to do it. And, you know, I think if the case is big enough, I think there's a real value to hiring a professional. But it's, I think it's, if it's not big enough, find a friend, have your friend argue, do your cases, you do your friend's cases, trade out, you learn every time you do one, even if it's on someone else's case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you talk to some of the professionals, they're like saying, you must do this, you must do that. It's got to be, you know, the same county or the exact same demographics. And you have to worry about how, you know, the, the make sure that the, your group looks like your jury and make sure you do all this stuff perfectly. And you have someone neutral giving both sides and they have like a million things you have to do or you don't have accurate data. And I found it's better to have some data that's that's still useful because they're not predictive anyway than to try to have a perfect social science experiment. I, I completely agree. Um, just the example that you gave um, at the beginning of this podcast of the three people that showed up in a tiny county in Texas that we were unfamiliar with. I mean, that was one of the most useful focus groups, but that was not an accurate <laughs> demographic of the right. the you know, the county and three people is predictive of nothing. I mean, out of all the people in the county, but, but the information that we got was so useful and so helpful to the case that it is still invaluable to even just get those three people. I agree. Um, so when is it you think you should use a professional and when is it you think it's, uh, you you can do it yourself and just kind of what the parameters of that are? Yeah. So I think, I, I'll just say it. Professionals are expensive. So you cannot use a professional if your case doesn't have the value to to spare for it. So you're just going to have to figure out a way to do it yourself or to get a friend to help you do it or another uh, a colleague of some of some kind that'll do it for free or you trade off or, you know, you give them a couple of eggs. Those are very valuable these days and then they do the focus <laughs> group for you. I don't know. But um, <laughs> the value of the case has to be there for you to hire a professional. They're very expensive. I have found that professionals are really helpful for um, more adversarial groups. They're able to lead the discussion a little bit better than I find them for concept focus groups. It doesn't mean I would I don't hire professionals for concept focus groups, and I still find them useful. But if I was to if I only if I could only hire a professional for one focus group in the whole case. I would choose an adversarial one rather than a concept focus group because a concept focus group is more of a discussion about what kinds of things might come out in the case. And the only person who knows that is you, right? It's hard to get a professional all the way up to speed in order to answer the random questions that the group might have and get them going down the right path, right? I mean, if they're going down a path that's just useless to you, to... The, the professional may or may not know that and doesn't know to steer it, steer it the other way. So I would say if you had to pick one, I would say an adversarial group because the professional will have heard the adversarial presentations, you'll be part of it, and then they can lead the discussion appropriately after that. Okay, well, let's say we have one where we're going to do it ourselves. How do we find the focus group members? We've done it different ways. Uh, like you said, we've done direct mail. I don't. Th I think that was the least effective. Um, I agree. 
way to get people. Um, We've got people on Facebook. Some people get people through temp agencies. Some people hire, there's these focus group companies that just recruit people. They're recruiting companies that just recruit people for different businesses and organizations that you can hire to get people. I think, you know, the best success that we've actually had, I think, is through Facebook. We just set up a company and um, do targeted advertising for a specific county and do it that way. I think that that's the best result, especially the best bang for your buck. When you hire some of these recruiting companies, the problem that you end up having is that people that show up for these focus groups have participated in focus groups before. That's how they find these people. They've, they're their list of people that they, they can call. And sometimes that taints their perspective a little bit. And the recruiting companies are more expensive. Now, yes. You know, also. sometimes that's the best way to do it just because you don't get a good enough response. And to be clear on the Facebook, don't do your law firm or your personal <laughs> right. page and put an ad up because you do not want the Facebook members to know who's the, I'm sorry, you do not want the focus group members to know who is hiring them. Uh, you, you, you know, you want to at least create the illusion that it's a, a neutral study or, you know, that we're not going to tell you who it is because it, there's always the, the, fear that they will try to please the people paying them or not want to hurt your feelings because they know what side you're on. So sometimes we even say, you know, we were hired by someone to go study this for them. We're not, you know, we're not representing anybody. We just got hired to find out what people think. The so Facebook, like what we've done, I think we have a Facebook page called Jury Research Project or something mm-hmm. like that, which That's is the, not what's called. You cannot tell that it's related to our law firm. And then we just got a cell phone that is just, you know, not listed in our name and that's that's where people can call. So we have like a Gmail email address that's not traceable to our law firm. We have a cell phone that's not traceable to our law firm. And that's what we use to contact the face. Again, because if, you, if you're if you calling to set up and it says calendar to use Peacock on the caller ID, then it's pretty clear who's who's calling. And, you know, they'll figure people they can't help. So they'll, they'll Google and figure out who's who's calling them and why. Same for, you know, don't do it at your law firm conference room. Uh, right. You know, if you, you know, if you have maybe a conference room in your building that's not related to you and you think and you don't have your name at the top of the building, maybe you can do it there. But I think we do most of ours in, you know, hotel room, conference rooms or other conference centers. We even run at a courthouse once. Uh, mm-hmm. They let us use it on a Saturday, but that's a little harder to do. But I do think having a neutral location is also important. How about the the venue? Do you think the you have to do the focus group in the same county where the lawsuit is pending? Yes and no. So if... If you're doing a concept group, actually any group, really, now that I'm thinking it through, any group, ideally, it would be in the county where the lawsuit is pending. Sometimes that's not possible. And reasons that it might not be possible are just logistics. It's super hard to get to or it's inconvenient. More often, it's that it's such a small county, you don't want to taint the jury pool which is a possibility. And, you know, you don't, you don't want to do 10 focus groups in your, in your county. And those are all the people that would show up for jury duty. And then you don't have any jurors. So you don't want to do that. But especially if it's a rural county, you can often go one or two counties over and get a good picture of what that area thinks, which is all that you really want, as long as the county has similar demographics um, and similar experiences. So what you don't want to do is, go from a county that's all oil field to to a couple counties over that's farming work or something like that, they might have a different perspective on your case because they're farmers and these people are oil field workers, depending on what your case is. So, you know, you do have to not just think about demographics, but what is the makeup of the county? What is the economy of the county? If you have a case that involves, you know, there's a highway and uh, Texas, they call it a death highway because it's so dangerous. All these truckers go constantly speeding on it. I think the speed limit gets up to 80 miles per hour. It's just super dangerous. Lots of people die on that highway. Testing in a county that has death highway in it where your crash occurred is so important because if you go a couple counties over, they don't even have a highway in that te- in that county. You're, you're not going to get the same feedback that you would in death county highway, right? Or death right. highway county. So you don't have to do it in that county, but you need to be very mindful of finding a county that's similar. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us by calling 210 210- 
941-1301 to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. And now, back to the show. Yeah, you know, when you're in a county with hundreds of thousands of people, it's not a big deal. But we sometimes have cases where we're in a county of 14,000 people. And I mean, not only do you have to worry about some of your focus group members showing up to jury duty, uh, but you also, people talk in small towns. I mean, you right. talk everywhere, but it's just more likely to get around and, and taint your jury pool. And, you know, the last thing you want is to get up for trial and then you can't get a fair jury because you've tainted your jury pool. And then now you're going to get transferred to another county and you're going to start the litigation. Basically, you're going to wait another year or two. And, you know, right. you don't want to do that to yourself and to your client. I, I just want to also make one aside, you know, you know, when we started doing this, everybody was on Facebook. Now, my son, who's 17, neither he nor any of his friends have a, a Facebook account and they don't want to be on the same social media platform as their parents. I don't blame them. When I was 17, I wouldn't want my parents to see everything I was doing and communicating with my friends. I think because of the, the age of the people that show up for jury duty, I think Facebook is still pretty useful to get something that's pretty similar to what we'd get in the jury pool. But I think as the years go by, we're going to see this Facebook versus other platform divide, and we're going to have to crack the code. Facebook is so easy because you can do a Facebook bad ads just directed at people over 18 years of age in a particular city or county. So the, and it's cheap. So the, the, the ability to target your ads on Facebook is super cheap to recruit your jurors. You know, we need to figure out when we have more younger jurors as the 20 somethings are no longer using Facebook and that becomes a bigger and bigger share of our jury pool. I think we're going to have to find another way to reach them. I don't have the answer for it yet. I just want to spot the issue because at some point we're going to overweight our, uh, if we keep doing it the same way in five, 10 years, we're going to be overweighting towards over older jurors and not have enough younger jurors on, on, and you know, younger people do show up for jury duty too. They do. And I think they have a different perspective. That's important for you to know <laughs> what, what is their perspective? But I, I agree. I, you know, it is an issue and Instagram and TikTok, they, they're less targeted. If you want to do ads on them, it just YouTube, you don't have to fill out all of the, that location age information to get on those platforms like you do with Facebook. Yeah. And we, we may need to start going to companies like AdRoll or other companies that can target ads on websites and stuff and not just in social media, you know, as, but right, right now, Facebook's working fine, but at some point in time, we're probably going to have to readdress our, our recruiting strategy. And just like everything else in life, the one thing also I want to just go back to recruiting that I've seen people do that I think really does give you a bad sample is going to uh, get people that are on an unemployment. And you get that sometimes with the temp agencies, but definitely when people just got it from, you know, the, the, in Texas, where the Texas Workforce Commission. So you can go, you know, put an ad out for people on unemployment and want to make some extra money. And it's all going to be people who got fired recently or laid off recently. And it, that really does give a different perspective. They're at a different point in life. And I found that those have been wildly inaccurate as opposed to our more traditional. You want to get a lot of people that have jobs because those tend to be a, a lot of your jury pool. So let's say, you know, we, we've got one. We've either hired a professional, we've done it ourselves. And then, you know, at some point they're going to go, they're going to talk, they're going to deliberate. Either they deliberate without us if it's an adversarial or, you know, we've had the conversation with them. How do we get the information from what they say into like a use, useful form that we can remember it and do something with it? It's always a challenge. Um, there's uh, because you don't want to lead the focus group so much that they just realize what you're doing and give you the answer you want. Right. <laughs> so, you know, so um, we've done it a bunch of different ways. So this last one, I think we had a hybrid of um, me taking notes with what they were saying and questions that they had to answer, you know, on a piece of paper and give reasons. Um, so I have questionnaires that I collected. Um, but I also have a bunch of notes just from the things that they deliberated about and the things that they found persuasive and the things that were uh, important to them that they just said. So you just have to sit there and watch them talk and take notes. Um, and then, you know, what I did is I just diluted it down into the purpose of it was to make sure that we're getting information, this last one, information we need in discovery. So I diluted it into here are the things that I found we need to go get in discovery because the focus group is really curious about them. So I just did a memo right afterwards to make sure that we had had it. Now, some people re record, um, uh, focus groups, like on tape or video. I don't think you have to do that. I don't find it necessarily useful because who goes back and watches eight hours worth of focus group deliberations? 
I, I, I wouldn't. So I don't know that that's helpful. If you're the type of person that can't sit through the focus group and take notes, then you have to record it because how else would you get information? So yeah, you could do a mix of questionnaires. and uh, But really, the questionnaires don't give you the information you really need. I mean, if you just give them a verdict form and it's a yes or no answer, the deliberation part is the part that you care about and the part that gives you the meat of the information. The yes or no it, it is not typically super relevant. Yeah, there there can be some advantages to videoing them. And one, you, you can go back and watch because you are much more zen than I am on this is that yeah. you can watch a focus group deliberate. I cannot. Uh, I can be in there when people are going, you know, when there's questioning stuff, but when, you know, when we get out of the room, you know, let's let them deliberate without us there. Sometimes we'll have a live video feed and we're recording it. And it, I know it's really interesting, but they usually get to the right place at the end, but people come up with all these crazy things and it just drives me nuts. And I just, I, you know, they said, well, no one ever told us X. I'm like, I said X five times and it just drives me crazy. And I can watch it once I know where they ended up. I can't watch it while they're doing it. It's just, um, it's a, personality defect I have. I know I need to grow up and get past it, <laughs> but I'm not. And and I'm 52. I may not grow up and get past it. And so, uh, you know, for me, like I said, I need someone else in there that I trust or I need someone to videotape it and, and I may or may not watch it later. The other thing that, and it's a little risky because you don't want to try, you don't want to end up making your focus group deliberations discoverable. But if you end up with some really good zingers that could scare the hell out of the defense, playing them and a mediation or showing them to an adjuster or defense lawyer sometimes creates a real fear that gets more money on your case. Now, they'll always say, well, I wasn't there. If I was presenting the case, it would have been different. I'm sure, you know, they, they, you get all this defensive stuff, but it still scares them. When they hear someone say something horrible about their company, it still scares them. Uh, or something say something about, you know, how many millions of dollars your client deserves, it still scares them. And uh, just the fact you do focus group research scares the other side because they know you're working on your case and you're getting ready for trial. But sometimes, like I said, we've been in cases where, you know, we're, you know, you want to get the case done, your client wants to get it settled. And, you know, those little clips sometimes are the difference that pushes that adjuster over to putting that last money on the table uh, and getting it done. So, I mean, there's, but again, there's always the risk that if, you know, focus groups are totally privileged, it's work product, but there's always the risk if you start showing it to people, then all of a sudden uh, things become discoverable. Right. I also, I wouldn't, I would not videotape like, the client or other witnesses testifying in a mock trial type thing, because that might become considered a witness statement that might become discoverable. And now all of a sudden, you know, maybe you're teaching them how to testify and you're using the earlier versions where they just weren't as articulate or they were tripping up. And then, you know, we never would tell someone to say something wasn't true, but sometimes the way people word things is confusing or just showing to practice, like you beat the crap out of them on cross to, to let them know what it's like. And then the defense can play you cross examining your own client at trial because, and so, you know, I, I think you look at your, at your uh, case law and your jurisdiction before videoing any kind of witnesses testifying, but I don't think there's any real danger of the focus group itself become discoverable. Although I can see some judge somewhere doesn't care what the law is. And if you show it to their side, they get to see the rest of it. And that, so just know your judge and know your jurisdiction before you do that. Yeah, for sure. I would definitely, um, make sure even if you videotape it, that you at least have some kind of form for a questionnaire. Even if even if it's a concept focus group, and you're not sure how it's going to go or what questions you might want them to answer, you can have just a blank form where they answer that just says question one, and then they just answer whatever you decide question one is just make sure you keep track of what the question is. But um, you know, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be formal and you don't have to come up with all the questions in advance to have a questionnaire, but to walk out with paperwork and data um, is, is so important to making sure that you get everything that you need from the focus group, if that makes sense. Yeah, the other thing I learned when we started, you know, we got this from working with consultants that would, you know, they, they would have a question and they would first have everyone write their answers before they start any kind of discussion. And then sometimes they would, they would do the discussion and write it again to see the discussion change the answers. But one thing I learned there is there are people that just aren't really comfortable in speaking up in a large group, but they still have opinions. And yeah, they're not going to be, those people aren't necessarily going to be your leaders on the jury, but they're still going to have thoughts and opinions and you still need to persuade them. And you end up sometimes only getting information from two or three really strong personalities. And the other people may silently disagree with them, but because if they're not deliberating to a vote, you don't really know it. And so it's really important to 
give them the opportunity to put what they think in writing as well as orally, because some people are more likely to give you more one way or more likely to give you more the other way. And you want to get as much information as you can. So speaking of getting information, focus groups, I, I just want people to know this. Focus groups can be eight hours. They can also be an hour. <laughs> Depends on what your goal is. I, I just want to keep reminding you guys that you, you don't have to fill time just to fill time. You need to have a goal for the focus group. What information are you trying to get? Um, and then get that information and move on with your life. I mean, you, you don't, you don't need to drag it out. I do find that when people start saying, Oh, I have this, I have this group for another two hours. Let me just do a totally different case and present that that second case, you're not going to get any good information because the focus group is going to have figured out who you are, what you're doing. It's, uh, you're just not going to get good information on that second case. So to, to throw random stuff in there, I would suggest against it. I mean, unless you absolutely have to, for some reason, um, I would I would say get a new group, set up a different day, set up a different time, so that people can move on from whatever it was that you were talking about before. Um, and in fact, we even do totally different groups for different issues in a case. So if I'm testing whether or not I should present medical bills in a case. If that's what my goal is, if that's what I need to find out, that's what I'm presenting to that group. I'm not also talking about my corporate negligence theory in that same group at that same time because it's too confusing and you're going to get mixed data and it's not going to be data that that helps you because the jury's so confused or the focus group's so confused about, wait, what are you even asking me to do here? So think about that too is isolate your issue for the group um, and present that. <laughs> don't Don't muddy the water with a bunch of different stuff all at once. So you're not going to get good feedback. Yep. There's another advantage to doing focus groups that I'm almost embarrassed to admit is true. But when we have to prepare for a focus group, it means you have to block off time, review the file, think of the best arguments to show that both sides could have the best visuals or evidence you can present for both sides. And it really makes you learn your case better at an earlier time in your case than you may otherwise do it. So the stuff that you're like just coming to you right before trial or right before a big deposition, you're learning earlier or thinking about earlier, uh, follow, you know, actually gets you to follow up on things. Maybe you had like, you go back and look at your notes when you took a depo and I've got like my three stars, follow up on this. And then I get back to the office and someone starts talking to me. And then, you know, two months later, I've forgotten to look at my notes and follow up on that. We're trying to get better at that. But the, you know, I think that's another advantage between focus groups. It's like I said, it's embarrassing to admit this. You know, we should be so perfect that we're just ultra disciplined. And after every depot, we're having a, a debrief and a follow up. And but the fact is, sometimes you get busy. And when you take time off to work on one of your better cases, uh, it does really help get you ready. And again, when you go to trial and you've done focus groups, especially when you've done ones where you've spoken to yourself, you know what the issues are, you know people are going to understand you, you know the arguments you make are going to resonate. You know it's not a guarantee, but it just really ups your confidence level uh, when you're going in there. And I think that makes a huge difference too. I would also say for the purposes of confidence, um, it's important that if what you're testing is yourself, so if you're testing your opening or your voir dire or the way you cross-examine a witness, that you have someone else do the debrief with the focus group <laughs> and then give you the information separately. Because what you don't want the focus group to do is totally destroy your confidence. And there's always, well, I don't know why, there's always one just sort of asshole in the group, right? It's yeah. just going to be rude for the sake of being rude. And you don't need to hear it, right? Like you don't need to hear that they hate the color of your hair or, or why do you dress like that? That's not helpful. And it's not information that's useful to the presentation of the case or, or anything like that. So if you're, if you have that one person saying stuff like that to you directly, it almost in your mind will invalidate the rest of what everybody has to say because you feel defensive. Right. So if what you're testing is something personal to you and the speaker, make sure you have someone else debriefing and then giving you the information in a neutral way that's helpful, right? You're going right. to have someone that says something ugly about you if you're doing this. It just, it is what it is. And that's not helpful. So you don't need to hear it. You just write it off, throw it away. And let that person present the stuff that you can actually change. So whether you're speaking too fast, whether your hand gestures are too wild, whether that the way that you said the rule was confusing, things that you can change, but the color of your hair or <laughs> isn't helpful. <laughs> yeah, and, and I agree. I, I, 
And, and I just also think it's asking too much of them. I mean, you have the one a-hole, but you also have like nine nice people that you said something they didn't like, but they're oh, no, you did True. a good job. Yes. You know, they're just people. That's how a lot of people are. They're nice. And, you know, nice is great as a person to person, but right. nice doesn't help you get ready for trial. And neither does that. So, I mean, I remember early in my career, I had one. I, I had just, I was overworked and I just wore some old shoes to do a focus group. I wasn't thinking. It was, there were never shoes I went to trial and the guy I had to do the focus group for me. He's like a local guy. I didn't really know what he was doing. He, uh, the first 10 minutes was going on about my shoes and telling me, well, they hated your shoes. Like, I would never have worn these shoes right. to trial. That's not, we're here about the issue of the case. What are right. we, why are you talking about my shoes? You know, but it's, uh, you know, if I had been in there, I would have really gotten defensive. Right. Well, I wouldn't have worn these to trial and, and this and that. And it, it would have been totally, it, it's still, well, I guess it's been 20 something years and it still bothers me. So not that I was embarrassed, just that we wasted time talking about shoes right. that I was never going to wear to trial. Uh, but I've also now learned now I've got to dress. It was a good lesson. If I want to do a focus group, I need to dress similar to how I would dress in trial so that I'm not creating another distraction. Yeah. yeah. Something else to think about is when you are just, I'm just getting into just general tips for focus groups, but another general tip is um, if you're doing an adversarial focus group and you're having two different lawyers present, you need to make sure that the lawyers presenting are not going to be distracting to the jury. So there can't be a huge difference in skill level between the two lawyers, because if so, you're not going to get good information. Or if there is a huge difference in skill level, make sure that the more skilled lawyer is doing the defense presentation. Because what you want is that I think any focus group person, any any person that does focus groups will say, uh, what you want is to lose the focus groups. <laughs> you want to lose because that gives you the most information. Right. But if you have the lawyer with less skill or less experience doing the defense presentation, you might be winning just because they're not as skilled or articulate or or whatever the issue is. So just be careful when you're having two people present because there could be a real difference. And there could even be a difference and not in skill level, but in likability that you didn't realize. Yeah. And that could come out too. And, and we've seen that happen where just for whatever reason, that jury just was really turned off by someone. <laughs> they just didn't like them. And, you know, yeah. it's good for that person to know, you know, going forward for their case presentation, but it makes any information you gather not as helpful because they're tainted by just not liking the lawyer. We've even done it where we switched. We did one in the morning and then, frankly, I had an ego thing. I thought, well, it's because, you know, I, did a, I didn't like the way the other lawyer at the firm had done the presentation. I thought I would have done it better. And so I get all in a huff and I switch. I said, we're going to switch places. I'm going to do the other side. You're going to do this side. And I don't remember who did plaintiff, who did defend it. And then we, we switched and then we had the exact yeah. same results in the afternoon. So. Uh, one, I guess maybe I'm not a better lawyer than that other lawyer at the firm. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, it, it really it showed it was the issue, not the person, because I was I was so worried it was the person, not the, not right. the issue are the not really the person, more the sequencing and arguments used during the presentation were different than what right. I would have done. Uh, so we switched it out and, and it didn't make a difference. And so then we had better confidence on what was going to happen right. in the case. So. Now you go back, you get, you know, let's say you do a focus group early, you find out all the things the juries want to want to know, the potential jurors want to know, the questions they have, your potential landmines. What do you do with that information? Um, so, um, you know, you got to use it, right? It depends on what you're trying to, it depends on what you're trying to do for the focus group. So if the goal of the focus group was to find out what information you still need to discover to do a full presentation of the case, well, then you need to go back and start drafting some discovery requests, start subpoenaing witnesses, start getting the testimony that the focus group wanted. And you shouldn't take for granted that what the focus group wants is stupid. So sometimes they want stuff that's that's dumb, that doesn't have anything to do with the case, that may or may not even be admissible. But what you don't want is anybody in the jury to feel like, God, if I only had this one ridiculous piece of information, I could have decided the case in your favor, but I didn't have it. And you shouldn't discount anything that they want. Um, you know, I've had focus groups where people say, well, what I, the case is about a rear end collision. And they say, well, what I, what I really want is to know the, the, where the plaintiff was going that day. My who. I mean, who cares, right? What, what does that matter? They were stopped at a stop sign and they got rear-ended. Like, what do, we, what do we care about where the plaintiff is going? 
it doesn't matter to you, but it mattered to them for some reason. And the answer is innocuous, right? It's there. They were going to pick up a case of water at HEB. Okay, great. You could say it in part of your presentation. It's not even a big deal, but it'll take whatever issue was going on in their head out of the picture for them. So, you know, even get... Or it, or it lets you know that there are some people that are primed to look for any reason to blame your plaintiff and that maybe bringing it out is going to hurt you because then they're going to go, right. aha. And they weren't looking at it because they were trying to blame any of that to blame the defense. They're looking at it because they're looking for reasons to blame your plaintiff. So I think, you know, you get the information, but sometimes... You know, sometimes you're going to see that there's some jurors who just do right. not want to rule a certain way, and they're always going to find some excuse not to, and it's not really the reason. And I think, you know, you you got to take everything in a whole. I mean, you you know, just because like one juror says, why, well, you know, people with blue shirts are not trustworthy. Right. So never, you know, I knew a lawyer like one when he was so scared going to trial because one juror said they didn't like his tie. One juror didn't like. I mean, he had all these. Things and they weren't the reasons he was winning or losing cases, but he was just absolutely convinced. He had like a long list of things. I can't wear green tie. I can't wear this kind of shoes. I can't do this. I can't do that. I, I mean, it just every excuse that someone gave for why they ruled, and those weren't the reasons right. that people ruled. But I think the you know the the things they bring up in discussion, I think, are really important. But you also have to, like I said, take it all. And it's a, this is just one weird person, or is there something that group has as a whole in that right. community? Um, the other thing too is if if you're testing an exhibit or an illustration or an animation, it's important that you take what the focus group says seriously and go back yeah. and make the edits that need to be made and then test it again, right? So you can't just take what they say, go do it and say, now it's good to go. You need to make sure that those edits actually did what that focus group thought it would do, right? So sometimes they say, this is a confusing exhibit. I don't understand. You need you need the dictionary definition of whatever and whatever. And so then when you add that and you go test it again, the people are like, why is this dictionary definition of whatever on there? I mean, yeah. you know, so that if you're testing those kind of things, you need to do it and then go back and test it again. You can't just test it that one time if you're making changes to it. Yeah. I think the, the the big message, though, is if you have a big case, you owe it to yourself and to your clients to, you know, to do some kind of focus groups. You know, if it's a big enough case, hire a professional. They do. If you have the right professional, they do do it better than we do. And and they also make it easier because they they handle a lot of the logistics and a lot of the other stuff. And you can just be the lawyer. But even if you don't have a case or a budget that supports that, you know, it's better to have some information, do it yourself. And if you can afford to do more than one. You know, on a big case, we like to do some early, some halfway through discovery, some towards the end, and then we have our trial tune-up stuff. On other cases, you know, the the it's either the budget doesn't support it or, you know, you just you have to make choices. You know, I've got, you know, even if you only have 20 cases, you can't do 20 focus groups on each case. You know, you have to uh, figure out what is the best use of my time, where I'm going to get my most bang for the buck. And But do what you can. But, you know, on the bigger ones, definitely do multiple. But even on a small one, just doing something is better than nothing. You know, even if it's just, what do they think about non-economic damages in this community? How, how can we best, you know, where this is what my client says is wrong with them. Is that going to resonate with jurors or not? Or do we need to go find another way to put it? What else do they want to know? I mean, just the more we arm ourselves with this information, the better off we're going to do a trial. And I think one of the reasons that the plaintiff's bar, I mean, verdicts are going up. People are winning more cases for more money lately. It's a wonderful thing. If you're, it's a wonderful time to be a plaintiff's lawyer right now. But I think part of that is that People have taken what they've learned doing jury research and focus groups, applied it, shared it with others. Other people are using it. And, you know, we're all helping each other do better for our clients. And frankly, for those of us who believe that, you know, good tort law, where jurors follow the law and, and allow money damages when people cause harm, is eventually going to make us a safer society. And so these are good things. So let's just keep doing the work and keep sharing with each other so that we can all do better. Thank you, Mallory. Uh, just another just a, a reminder, our Big Rig Boot Camp is coming up. We're going to have it in San Antonio, uh, June 16th. Uh, registration is open. If you go to BigRigBootCamp.com, that's B-I-G-R-I-G BootCamp.com, uh, there's a form where you can register. It's going to be a, a great presentation. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're not only going to you know share everything we know about trucking cases, we're going to talk about our method uh, that's going to be in my upcoming trial guides book, which Big Rig Justice, which should be out by the seminar. That's what they're telling me uh, that we've developed to work up these cases and then examples of how to put it into practice. Uh, but we're also going to have a lot of fun things, even for the ethics. We're not just going to have people talking about ethics, but Mallory, you're going to be our game show host on Ethics Jeopardy, where it's going to be competitive, fun, win prizes, lights, music. It'll be just a, a, a wonderful experience and free drinks. Huh. 
it'll be an open it'll, bar. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, I'm so excited. So much is getting put into this this year. Um, so if you've been before, this year is going to be even better. So, yeah, we're really upping the you know, the AV, the lights, the the screens, all that kind of budget. Really working on our presentation. So it's you know it's it's five months away, but we're already working really hard on it. And hopefully, anyone that does any kind of trucking or, or commercial vehicle cases, we're also going to talk about how you apply what works in trucking cases to to cases involving other kind of employers from, you know, an air conditioning company, an oil field company, even your Domino's repairman or not, not Domino's repairman, Domino's delivery driver. <laughs> so it should be a, a good presentation. We're really trying to make it useful so that you will be able to take things and use them in your cases. It's not just about, hey, give Michael and Mallory your cases. It's about where we want to make you a better lawyer. Uh, if there's cases we can work together, wonderful. If not, we want you to, to thrive and succeed in your practice. And we want to share what, what we've learned with you. And it's just a Another way we can do that. All right. Sounds good. I can't wait to see everybody there. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you'd like to receive updates, insider information, and more from Trial Lawyer Nation, sign up for our mailing list at triallawyernation.com. You can also visit our episodes page on the website for show notes and direct links to any resources in this or any past episode. To help more attorneys find our podcast, please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast on any of our social media outlets. If you'd like access to exclusive, plaintiff lawyer-only content and live monthly discussions with me, send a request to join the Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle Facebook group. Thanks again for tuning in. I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us by calling 210-941-1301 to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our host, guest, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.